Welcome back to more Warhammer lore. In today's video we will be delving back into the Skaven, but this time the focus will primarily be their military, including units, tactics, and command structure. Now in order to understand how and why they have developed certain tactics, we must look into the why these nefarious machines, abominations, plagues, and assassins' poison daggers were invented in the first place. Now we have covered a great deal of their units in previous lore videos, so see back to those for more information. In fact, I think I will link them in the description below. Now very early in Skaven history, in fact one could say nearly their first war, was with both man and dwarf. This happened at Kavzar, a now forgotten and ruined city in Talea. There the Skaven embraced their base nature and washed over the stunted attackers in a great horde. This tactic is one that the Skaven embrace even to this day, and is generally the goal of any Skaven force to circumvent the cowardly nature of their troops. For Skaven receive greater courage in numbers, which roughly translates to more leadership if we think of it in both uh, tabletop and total war. However, this tactic was put to the test during the Great Migration, where the Skaven spread across the Warhammer world. Their very first fights were more than likely against the dwarf things of the mountain, as the Great Machine had punched a hole into the Dwarven Underway, which helped expedite the spread of the vermin. The dwarfs having come full aware that not only do Skaven exist, but that they were a credible threat to their dwindling empire, began to amass in greater numbers, to meet them in battle as well as refortifying and even completely closing off passages into their cracks, as to funnel the vermin into a checkpoint, where their vast hordes numbers meant very little, as the dwarfs could simply grind them into a pulp, their stamina more than a match for the numbers of unskilled fighters of the Thagaraki. This is when the first of what would become Clan Scryer would come into existence. You see, Every Skaven wishes to dominate its brethren, and the best and easiest way to extort, kill, and bribe your way to the upper echelons of society is to form a clan, with which one can wield great amounts of power. For this reason, clans are made with a specific niche in mind, to differentiate them from the countless other clans, and ultimately give value and more prestige to the warlords of said clan. The dwarfs could not be broken by numbers alone. And so the beginnings of Clan Scryer began utilizing their surprising intellect and copious amounts of warpstone to supplement Skaven tactics. This is when the Warplock Jezile was created, as well as many other infernal devices, which were adapted from Dwarven technology. With these new weapons of war and the new burrowing beasts of Clan Mulder, tunnels could be quickly made and small teams of specialized troops could be smuggled behind enemy lines, allowing the Skaven to pop up, hopefully, and their intended location and harry the stunties from two sides, even within the narrow tunnels of the cracks. Of course, the dwarfs then became accustomed to this, and when a large force of Thagaraki was noticed, the dwarf things would pull back to the great halls of the lower deeps and force the Skaven into a pitched battle, as the halls are so large that the dwarven siege equipment could be utilized. This led to many vast hordes being decimated, as they were not accustomed to swarming over the enemies in the tight corners of tunnels, and this was more akin to what would be considered a surface battle, a way of fighting foreign to the Skaven completely at the time. But the Skaven are ever adaptable, and sometimes around this was when the great rat ogres came into a being, capable of taking immense damage and breaking dwarven lines as well as the more portable and quick warp grinders. This allowed the Skaven to claim victory over many dwarven throngs, and even Karax, the dwarfs themselves, thought would never fall. However, the next challenge would result in many further nefarious inventions. Crack Eight Peaks, or as the Skaven know it, the City of Pillars was the second largest dwarven hold in the Karaz Encor. It was thought to be unassailable, and for the most part it was, had the dwarfs not been in a weakened state and under siege on the surface from various orc and goblin tribes, and so the dwarfs were forced to spread their forces thin, and therefore were only able to field their armies in the great halls of the underway, where their numbers would be put to better use as their enemies were too numerous to cover the many entrances into the hold. This coupled with the Gromreal armor of the famous Ironbreaker units led to many Skaven routes, despite their blatant advantage in numbers. Because of this change of tactics by the Dwarfs, the Warlock engineers of Clan Scryer came up with some devastating and bizarre weapons of war. At this time, the Poison Wind Globadiers and Warp Fire Throwers were invented, 
capable of melting even the Grumrill armor of the dwarfs, or simply bypassing the formidable shield walls with poison wind. Of course, these devices have a relatively short range, and so once the dwarfs determined that, they adapted once more. However, not to be outdone, the infamous Doom Will, Warp Lightning Cannon, and Doom Flayers came into existence. The Doom Flayer in particular functions as a spinning ball of death and metal. It's not manned, and they are released at a certain distance from the Dwarven line, and through steam and warpstone energy are propelled in hopefully the right direction to a devastating effect. With these inventions, even the Quarrelers and Thunderers were of little use in saving the front line from devastation. And Crack Eight Peaks, the city of pillars, fell to the Skaven. At least, the lower depths. But that's probably a story for another time. This victory would ensure the slow decline of the Dwarven race, as well as prove that the Skaven, despite their many setbacks, are in fact a great military power in the Warhammer world. This would be further solidified in another conflict with a very unexpected enemy. This is a rather long and brutal conflict, and I will probably cover it in more detail when I make my Nagash video. So for now, just know that the Verminkin were drawn to Cripple Peak by the copious amounts of warpstone the undying sorcerer of Nagash was mining out of the mountain. This led the Skaven into a war of attrition for the first time against an enemy that truly could sustain its numbers as fast as the Ratmen. This war would drag on for generations of Skaven kind. Seeing how they only live for about 20 years as is, the leadership of the uh, said assaults was kept alive by the council through the salves of Clan Mulder. Now, neither side was capable of getting the upper hand. Even with all of the Skaven ingenuity of Clan Scryer, the monsters of Clan Mulder, the treacherous Grey Seers, and the vast hordes of Clan Rats, nothing could bring Nagash's forces down permanently. And for the first time, the Council 13 decided that they would not support this war any longer. It would not be worth the any more damage to their economy than it was to actually capture the Warpstone Mines of Crippled Peak. But as fate would seem, Nagash felt very similar about this war. For this ongoing war with the Skaven kept him from realizing his true goals. And so the Sorcerer sent one of his cold men, as the Skaven knew them. What we would know as an immortal, uh, not quite a vampire, but close. And he was sent to broker a treaty with the Skaven. He would supply them with Warpstone, and they would bring him slaves, specifically orc tribes that Nagash could use as hardy shock troops. Now, we are straying slightly off topic here, and like I said, I would like to dedicate an entire video to this conflict. So to sum it up, the Skaven accepted this treaty, but never truly trusted the Lich. Once they found out what he was up to, they pulled their resources and created a weapon capable of killing even the great Nagash. The sword known as Fellblade was forged for this exact purpose. With it, the council had a mere human, the former king of Kemri, slay the sorcerer in a weakened state after his great ritual to raise the dead of Kemri. Say what you will about the Ratmen, but you can't deny their clever schemes and often ingenuity at resolving even the daunting task of killing what was essentially an undying sorcerer, on par with even some would say the mighty Slan. Now we've spent a pretty sizable time discussing the history of the Ratmen at this point, and there is lots of history to go over. I could go over this for probably an entire video, but this video is supposed to be about the Skaven battle tactics and military units, so let's get back on topic. Now these moments in history do relate to the topic at hand in that they give examples of how quick to adapt the Skaven are to um, different styles of fighting. And we have discussed how the Skaven normally wage war, and that they like to overwhelm their foe in a great verminous tide, and drag them down with sheer numbers. This is a very valid tactic, as the Ratmen are by far the most numerous of any species in the Warhammer world. Maybe, um, second to the- well, no. I would say they are the first, and the Greenskin are probably second to them, and then the Beastmen shortly after them. And because of this, they can take significant losses in battle, which they often do. It's not that big of a deal for them as they breed so quickly that they can recoup from these numbers. Now, these tactics have changed and been refined over time as they have been exposed to the various battlefields and races of the Warhammer world. 
For this reason, the Skaven have a very wide and diverse roster when compared to most races, capable of countering most foes, in a Skavenly way, of course. As I covered in a previous video, the average Thakaraki is about the size of a man, very agile and not that strong. This is overemphasized when you come to the realization that Skaven need to eat five to six times a day to maintain their mass. This of course has led to the majority of the population being severely malnourished, especially the Skaven slaves, which, which are present in every great Skaven horde. For all intents and purposes, the way a typical Skaven army fights is very similar to the Roman style of our own world. In the Roman army, the most untested, your new recruits or your first line sent in against an enemy. For the Skaven, the slaves are sent ahead of the main horde to eat any incoming artillery and skirmishing fire and to actually engage the enemy. The sheer amount of slaves is so numerous that they often do in fact make it to the enemy line, despite this suicidal tactic that most races would never do. This is the Skaven slave's main purpose, to be expendable, as well as tire out the enemy. Now they are not tiring out the enemy by engaging them in glorious combat and displays of swordsmanship and valor. They tire the enemy out by dying by the truckload. The tactic is to literally have the enemy exhausted by killing so many Skaven that they can't resist the next wave of attack. Now this style of warfare works very well against most surface dwellers, especially humans, but it is rather ineffective against dwarfs as they have a ridiculous amount of stamina and oddly don't need much in the way of nourishment or sleep, but ideally the enemy would be tired from killing so many ratmen in quick succession that the then clan rats would come in to mop up what was left. Now clan rats are a dime a dozen, not as numerous as Skaven slaves, but still extremely expendable. They in fact are armed, which is a lot more than the slaves are afforded. However, they undergo very little actual training and they also proceed to tire their enemy out, which leads to the final wave being the elite storm vermin, the most well armed and well trained of the Skaven. In this way, the warlords assure that their best and most valuable troops are kept from harm's way, while the most expendable and useless do all the actual work. Of course, depending on the enemy, this, the tactics can be modified with the supplement of many scryer weapons teams indiscriminately hosing down an enemy and friendly alike, but hey, it doesn't really matter if a few rat can die to assure victory. In fact, they should be honored to die for their betters. All similarities with the Roman Empire aside, this is actually a good point to segue into the more specialized forms of warfare and how they came to be. I did mention earlier that the Skaven form clans around a particular niche. Now this can be a commodity such as growing black corn, or perhaps a service like faring goods or Skaven. But more often than not, this comes in the form of some battlefield niche, some specialized units. This is where the four great clans shine, as they are by far the most successful in their battlefield niche. We have gone into considerable depth on these four great clans, so for more lore on them, check out their individual videos. Clan Mulder is famous for its beast of war and burden, Clan Scryer for their bizarre inventions and weapons teams, Clan Eshin for their assassins and scouting prowess and Klein Pestilence for their sickly fanaticism and unnatural bravery. Well, for Skaven, that is. Another up-and-coming clan is Clan Moors, the clan of Queek Headtaker, whom are famous for their large amounts of black-furred storm vermin and are in fact creeping into power levels of the Great Clans, and so the Great Clans have a very close eye on Clan Moors. Now, I do want to point out a few tactics of the Great Clans before we move on, and give a brief summary of which each clan's style of warfare is good at and whom they match up against well. First is Clan Molder. If you have seen my Molder video, then you know that they specialize in breeding and mutating horrifying abominations. A often overlooked fact about this is that the Skaven as, as a society have a severe case of xenophobia, and so as little as they trust each other, they trust other races even less. Which is why the Packmasters of Clan Mulder appear to have bred Skaven into all of their creations. Not many people know why this is done, and if it is simply done the old-fashioned way, or simply from copious amounts of warp stone inducing mutations, the resulting beasts therefore often have the appearance of a Skaven in some way, usually having a 
rat-like head and snout, or sometimes even multiple heads. However, unlike Skaven, all of these beasts are bred often with loyalty and bravery in mind. This appears to be to make up for the lack of each of the virtues that the normal Thagaraki do not possess, which is why a Clan Molder army is much often smaller than an average clan army as the great beasts are relied upon to either break the enemy line in a head-on charge, followed up by the clan rats, or relied on to rout the enemy as they hit from the flanks, while the front line is occupied dealing with the Skaven slaves and other chaff. Of course, like all the other clans, they are often mercenaries in a parent army, and since these abominations have little fear, they make excellent troops for charging entrenched forces, or perhaps even races that would naturally induce fear in the ratmen like the Undead, or even Chaos. The next clan is Clan Scryer, whom are responsible for the bizarre techno-sorcery of the Under Empire. The Scryer army is made up mostly of weapons teams and war machines, primarily focused on outraging the enemy and butchering them from a distance, a very Skaven-like approach to warfare if there ever was one. Of course, these weapons are highly unstable and prone to many accidents, but this is acceptable to the Warlock engineers. Now, as I said earlier, clan scryers primarily use war machines in conjunction with clan rats and slaves. Similar to clan Mulder, the goal is to tie down the enemy with chaff and destroy the morale of the enemy with constant artillery and skirmishing fire, often with disregard to the lives of their own kind. This is why in tabletop, the Skaven are allowed to purposely perform friendly fire into their own units and not receive a morale penalty, because it is just something expected when Clan Scryer goes to war. Now for this reason, they match up incredibly well with elite infantry armies, so you're looking at dwarves and probably elves, as you can engage them with your massive numbers and grind them out while you pour on the artillery damage into your own troops, obviously, but mostly into their elite infantry units, and they can't afford to take the losses that a Clan Scryer army, or any Skaven army for that matter, can take and keep going. The next clan is Clan Pestilence. Now these Skaven are very different from the standard Ratkin. For one thing, they are surprisingly tough, as the various diseases they are inflicted with has made them nearly immune to pain, very similar to Nurgle units. It is said that the only way to kill them is to perform an obvious killing blow, usually involving the loss of the Plague Monk's head, as simply losing a limb to a member of Clan Pestilence is not that big a deal, as they have been known to simply scoop up their disemboweled entrails and keep fighting however they can. Another unique trait to the Plague Monks is their unnatural bravery. One would assume that this is due to the various diseases eating away at their grey matter, which is more than likely true but this is also due to the unwavering faith they have in the Horned Rat, a religious fervor that compels them to acts of suicidal bravery. When Clan Pestilence marches to war, they do it bigger than any other clan, as they can field entire hordes of Plague Monks, who unlike a regular army unit, voluntarily serve themselves up as cannon fodder in the name of the Horned One, while vile poisons from the Great Plague Furnace and Sensor Bearers take a heavy toll on both the enemy and Plague Monks alike. Their style of warfare is more of a grinding of attrition and morale, as the enemy is weakened by the filthy monks and their weapons, spreading filth which lowers the morale of the enemy, making them easier to shatter in a prolonged engagement, which is what they strive for. This makes the Plague Monks excellent choices when engaging elite, lightly armored infantry, such as the Lizardmen seen as how a normal unit of clan rats would shatter from fear, but the plague monks don't have that problem, and through sheer numbers can pull down even these ancient warriors. The last of the four great clans, and probably my favorite clan, is Clan Eshin. Now the armies of Clan Eshin are primarily built around assassinating key targets, flanking and harassing. They are excellent at taking enemy fortifications and harrying unguarded artillery and skirmishers. Due to their training, the rats of Clan Eshin are far faster than their kin, and much more brave and adept in combat. For this reason, a Clan Eshin army is much more smaller and more committed to flank attacks and getting rid of leadership of the enemy army than any other Skaven clan. Of course, they often do not go to war themselves, but are positioned as scouts and relied upon by many warlords to silence artillery crews and skirmishers of the enemy army their stealth and speed allowing them to gain the advantage against these units. Of course, they aren't bad in a straight-up fight, 
but their limited numbers mean that they cannot field their assassins and trainees as frontline troops. Instead, much like Mulder and Scryer, they rely on slaves and their own unique clan rats to hold the line, while the main killing force of the army pursues the flanks. Now, Clan Ashen will be very good against fighting pretty much any enemy. They can adapt to any enemy whatsoever. They have different skills for each race in the Warhammer world. They always rely on si silence, but I think their primary advantage is taking fortifications. So if you're sieging a settlement, you want Eshin assassins and night runners and gutter runners scaling the walls and sowing discord in the back lines. That's what they're good for. They're good for getting into the back lines and quickly and quietly dispatching those units that can just damage you so much. And so that's what their main purpose is on the battlefield. Now we have finally covered enough to get into the Skaven roster and how it could be possibly used in Total War. We've covered many of these units in the Great Clan videos, so for the most part I will be mentioning them and then going over the final roster towards the end of the video. Skaven Slaves are also known as Slave Rats or Clan Rat Slaves and are mostly lowly individuals of the Skaven race. Standing a stunted four feet tall, Skaven Slaves form the largest bulk of the Skaven swollen population. They're usually born in this manner, barely holding out through a cruel, abused childhood and being of little value simply shoved into forced labor. Living past m many than a handful of years is quite a cursed accomplishment. Skaven slaves are also always swelling with captured or defeated clan rats, demoted in their loss and shoved into the lowly ranks. Almost all slaves die as slaves. The entire infrastructure of the Under Empire is run by slave labor. Skaven slaves perform all menial tasks, including mining, tunneling, and food production. In lean times, they themselves serve as food. The majority of slaves are Skaven born into bondage, the lowest class of a hierarchical society. The ranks swell as rival clans are captured during interesting wars. At times, even non-Skaven become slaves, though few other races last long under the whips of the Ratmen overseers. The life of a Skaven slave is cruel, but mercifully short. Edible food is so rare that cannibalism is the way of life, and each day is a battle for survival. A slave with the slightest injury, such as a limp or disease swollen eye, is often hungrily marked by his pack. These wretched creatures attempt to hide such maladies, but the king's skaven sense of smell cannot be fooled. The crippled are soon devoured as the ravenous horde turns upon itself. Now, skaven slaves in the lore do not have to be just skaven. In fact, there are many human, orc, and occasionally dwarf slaves in the Under Empire. In Total War, the Skaven slaves act much like they do in the lore. They are expendable, cheap infantry, coming in three variants, plain old Skaven slaves, spear variety, and a cheap, which will be a cheap anti-large, and a unit with slings. They each appear to have their use. The regular slaves will be excellent for bogging down infantry and eating skirmishing and artillery fire in mass, while the spear variety will be your cheapest anti-large unit. Of course, they won't have armor piercing, so heavy and medium cavalry would more than likely just smash through them, if you are foolish enough to rely on them to actually hold a line. The slings are interesting and unexpected, but may be the most useful of the bunch, as their abysmal leadership should not be affected if they aren't engaged in melee combat, meaning they can flank an enemy of a much higher quality and do relatively decent damage to them while staying out of harm's way. Now moving on to the Clan Rats, which represent the rank and file troops of the Skaven. Compared to most other Skaven, they are unremarkable. Not surprisingly, they are the Ratmen who are most commonly encountered, either within the Under Empire or in the world above. Senior Clan Rats are known as Claw Leaders, and each one is given dominion over his own Clan Rat troop. Though they are more experienced and better able to wage war than their subordinates, most claw leaders compare unfavorably to storm vermin. When a warlord gathers his clan for war, the clan rats are front and center, occupying a key place in the battle line, led by a claw leader. The Skaven warriors form in the great blocks of infantry and try to overwhelm a foe with their sheer weight of numbers and the fury of their attack. If the warlord can afford the price and is in reasonable standing with clan scryer, then a weapons team might accompany these regiments. These arcane devices of destruction are, are viewed suspiciously by the clan rats who frequently suffer due to their all too frequent 
technical failures. After the adrenaline burst of melee, clan rats need to feed or suffer the unbearable pangs of the black hunger. Immediately following any combat, the ratmen scour the battlefield, devouring the dead and injured or friend and foe alike. Now in tabletop, clan rats only have a sword and shield, but we are getting clan rats with no shield. The standard sword and shield, clan rats with spears, and a spear and shield variant. Now, I was not expecting all of these different varieties of clan rats, especially the spear variety whatsoever. They don't exist in tabletop, from what I've been able to study, but there are brief instances in the lore where spears are mentioned being used in battle by the Skaven. This of course is being done to give the Skaven a better anti-large contingent in their roster, as large creatures and cavalry are one of the biggest weaknesses of the Skaven race. With the Spear Clan Rats, we now will have a way besides the Halberd Storm Vermins to get in that anti-large component to make them a more viable race in the uh, Total War Warhammer. Moving on to the Storm Vermin, which are the Black Furred Elite of Skaven Military Might. They are, to an individual, larger than the average Skaven, well-muscled, and proficient in the use of various weapons and armor. They are aggressive by nature and are given to overt displays of prowess in order to intimidate those around them. Like the Grey Seers, their future is determined at the time of their birth, for only a Skaven with black fur are elevated to the ranks of Storm Vermin. As such, there is a certain air of ego shared together by all Storm Vermin that is lacking in other Skaven groups. Of course, the co this camaraderie will only stretch so far. Storm Vermin are constantly on the lookout for any weakness in their peers, and those who sow such flaws will be mercilessly cut down by their brothers. Position in the ranks of the Storm Vermin is achieved through a series of duels, though it occasionally falls on the last remaining survivor of a unit to take command. These officers, known as Fane Leaders, are some of the deadliest Storm Vermin of all. Storm Vermin regiments are outfitted with the best spoils of war in the clan's armory, and their duties may include forming a retinue or bodyguard for anyone from a minor chieftain to the mighty ruling clan warlord himself. This puts the Storm, Storm Vermin at the vanguard of the army, where they can ensure continued preferential treatment by fighting with the ferocity and zeal for their leader. Most warlord clans maintain the unwritten law that the first feed after a battle belongs to the Storm Vermin. Those who dare feast before their proper station are often openly attacked by the elite Skaven warriors, who take any opportunity to violently demonstrate their favored status. As further reward, many Storm Vermin regiments are assigned their own legions of Skaven slaves. These lack AC to the comfort and needs of their masters. On the battlefield, Storm Vermin normally form the bodyguard of warlords and the Grey Seers. Now we are receiving the Storm Vermin in Total War, but we are getting them in a somewhat un unexpected variety. In tabletop, this unit is only equipped with halberds, and traditionally in lore, that is one of the ways that they are set apart from other Skaven. However, in some of the older, and I mean really old army books, there are mention of storm vermin with swords and shields, and so we are getting both the halberd and sword and shield versions in the Total War Warhammer. They are obviously the only heavily armored infantry the Skaven have, and will function as their elite troops though they will have greater numbers than most elite infantry as fitting of Skaven in general. They will be more akin to greatswords of the Empire in strength, meaning that they are elite infantry but will not match up well against factions such as Chaos Warriors or Dwarfs which would easily win a fight against Storm Vermin, but they would at least slow them down faster than any of your other Skaven infantry. Now the rest of the infantry roster we have covered in previous videos so for more details on those, go see those videos. The rest of the tabletop roster that fills out the Skaven infantry, in addition to the units we just covered, are Plague Monks, Sensor Bearers, Night Runners, Gutter Runners, and Pack Masters. We are getting all of these with the exception of the Pack Master in uh, Total War Warhammer, which unfortunately are missing. Now we will be moving into Clan Scryer territory with the mini weapons teams. There are Poison Wind Globadiers, Warp Flock Jezziles, the Warp Fire Thrower, the Rattling Gun, Poison Wind Mortar, the Warp Grinder, and the Doom Flare. While the Doom Flare might be considered artillery, I think it more fits into this category since they tend to have more units than typical artillery. 
See my Scryer video for details into these units and more. And now we are not receiving the Warp Black Jezzyles, the Doom Flares, or the Poison Wind Mortar as of right now. But I do suspect that they will be very likely added in any future DLC. Which then leads us into the actual artillery in the Warp Lightning Cannon, Plague Claw Catapult, the Doom Wheel, the Plague Furnace, and the Screaming Bell. Now oddly, all of these units, all these artillery units, made the cut for the initial roster, much to my surprise. The Skaven are truly going to be a powerhouse when it comes to War Machines, as they have probably some of the coolest and most useful units in Warhammer, in my opinion. Then we move into the Clan Molder territory in the War Beasts. These include the Giant Rats, Rat Ogres, Wolf Rats, and the Hell Pit Abominations, which the Skaven use in war to make up for their cowardly nature. As all but the Giant Rats have relatively high leadership for Skaven units, though not exactly the smartest of animals. Shockingly, we are in fact getting the Hell Pit Abomination and the Rat Ogres, not surprisingly. However, I was hoping for the Wolf Rats and I just don't understand why they weren't added as a fast light cavalry to the roster. We are getting all of the hero units available to the Skaven with the exception of the Pack Master. So that means we are getting the Warlock Engineers as a pseudo casting skirmishing unit. We are getting Eshin Assassins as Assassins, obviously, and Plague Priest as a caster unit. Now we will be seeing Grey Seers, but they can only be Lords or Generals of your armies, as well as the standard Warlord. Your only other option being the old fashioned Skaven Warlord, as I said, to close out the entire roster. Now there is no mention of Vermin Lords as of yet, and besides if we do get Vermin Lords, I suspect they will be a um, elite hero, almost, kind of like the Green Knight. And in tabletop, they're not allowed to lead your armies anyway, so I don't think that they will ever be a general type unit. Now as a quick recap to cover what we are getting in Total War Warhammer, I'm going to read their entire roster. So we are getting Queek Headtaker and Lord Skrulk as our legendary lords. We are getting Grey Seers as generals as well as, as, well as Skaven Warlords as generals again. We're getting the Assassin the Warlock Engineer, and the Plague Priest as heroes. We're getting Skaven Slaves, Skaven Slaves with Spears, and Skaven Slaves with Slainers. Then we are getting Clan Rats, Clan Rats with Shields, Clan Rats with Spears, Clan Rats with Spears and Shields, and Storm Vermin with Halberds, and then Storm Vermin with Sword and Shields. We are also getting the Plague Monks, the Plague Monk Sensor Bearers, Night Runners, Night Runners with Slings, Gutter Runners, Gutter Runners with Poison, Gutter Runners with Slings, Gutter Runners with Slings and Poison, and then we are getting the infamous Death Runners, see my action video for them, very cool unit. We are getting the Warp Fire Thrower, Poison Wind Globadiers, Death Globe Bombadiers, which are a upgraded vor version of Poison Wind Globadiers, confirmed. Rat Ogres, Plague Claw Catapult, Warp Lightning Cannon, the Doom Wheel, and the infamous Hell Pit Abomination. Now, the Skaven appear to be very close to the tabletop version of the game, meaning that they have a problem with units routing, as they all have extremely low leadership, very similar to goblins in the Greenskin roster. In fact, they even have a faction trait that when they break, they actually increase in speed to get away from the enemy and reform, meaning that when you're fighting Skaven, you often will have to either pursue them to the ends of Earth, or you will have to fight them multiple times. There are a very diverse and flexible army, with lots of tools to deal with various other races. Going up against dwarfs, bring monsters and artillery. Going up against lizardmen, bring anti-large contingents and fast-moving skirmishers, and simply swarm over anyone who stands in your way. And the same can be said for each race. You can pick out a trait that the Skaven have in their roster, and it will be a good counter. For any opposing faction. Now with that said guys, I am finally closing out this military roster and tactics video. If you have questions, leave them in the comment section and I will do my best to answer them promptly. And hell, leave me a comment if I missed anything, as I often do make mistakes as you all probably well know by now. I did mention the Doom Flares, I got back on that for you guys. <laughs> but 
If you have stuck with me for this long, thank you for watching. I appreciate all of the support for the lore vids, guys. And I will be posting a schedule, which I actually I already posted says schedule. And I probably have needed to make this for a while. So it's just going to give you an idea of uh, what to expect from me content-wise if you want to check it out. So thanks for watching and make sure to like and subscribe to keep up with the channel. And all future lore vids, guys. It's going to be the easiest way for you to keep up with everything i got going. So, in closing out, I have been Jumbo Thick, guys. Once again, thanks for watching, and I hope to see you guys in the next one. Have a good day.